Dobry wieczór Państwu. To wielki zaszczyt i przyjemność móc powitać Państwa na Uniwersytecie SWPS z okazji niezwykle wyjątkowego wydarzenia. To wyjątkowe wydarzenie ma miejsce za sprawą Pana Profesora Stefana Hoffmana z Uniwersytetu w Bostonie, który zaszczycił Uniwersytet SWPS i trzy instytucje w obrębie tego Uniwersytetu organizujące to wydarzenie, czyli Centrum Studiów Podyplomowych i Szkoleń ze Szkołą Psychoterapii Poznawczo-Behawioralnej, Klinikę Terapii Poznawczo-Behawioralnej. Mamy wielki zaszczyt powitać Pana Profesora, ponieważ i pozwolę sobie wyjaśnić to w języku polskim, gościmy dzisiaj osobę, która jest człowiekiem, który wyznacza kamienie milowe w terapii poznawczo-behawioralnej, we współczesnej terapii poznawczo-behawioralnej. Autora ponad 20 książek, 400 artykułów naukowych. No i przede wszystkim książki, która ostatnio wydana została w 2018 roku na świecie i była rewolucyjną publikacją, kończącą dyskusję o trzech falach, a my mamy dodatkową przyjemność, że ta książka jest jeszcze ciepła, ponieważ została wydana również w języku polskim i będzie dostępna dla polskiego czytelnika. Mówimy o publikacji Process Based CBT, terapia poznawczo-behawioralna ukierunkowana, terapia poznawczo-behawioralna oparta na procesach. Została ta książka wydana dosłownie w ostatnich dniach, jest jeszcze ciepła nakładem Gdańskiego Wydawnictwa Psychologicznego i jest to wielki kamień milowy w terapii, w teorii terapii poznawczo-behawioralnej. Dlatego nasz wielki zaszczyt, że Pan Profesor będzie zechciał podzielić się swoją wiedzą i być na Uniwersytecie SWPS. I dzisiejszy wykład będzie dotyczył również tematu, który jest tematem niezwykle gorącym w tym obszarze, w obszarze szeroko pojętej psychoterapii regulacji emocji. To będzie wykład, który, po którym będzie możliwość dyskusji, zadawania pytań. Ogromnie dziękujemy, jest to wielki zaszczyt i wielka przyjemność. Thank you that you agreed to come and it's our great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, a real pleasure. Uh, I've been enjoying my time greatly and I hope to be back. So one of those processes that uh, uh, Agnieszka mentioned is uh, emotion regulation. And I'm going to talk more about emotion regulation. Um, if you want to um, gain further insight into what I'm going to talk, uh, about this, uh, I will uh, refer to the book Emotion and Therapy, and also my more recent book, uh, The Social Foundations of Emotion, which uh, very much su supplement uh, the book that uh, were just presented on process-based therapies. Uh, now, when you look at um, the term emotion uh, in the literature, you'll see a dramatic increase uh, over the years. Uh, so in uh, 60s, 70s, uh, you had around the uh, uh, just about some hundred or so publications that increased uh, in the 1990s and uh, more recently, 2000, 2010, uh, as you can see, the uh, increase was fairly dramatic. Um, and emotions have been around in our field for quite some time. Uh, in fact, uh, it, uh, lots of the, uh, what, what uh, contemporary psychologists are debating um, is very much linked to some Darwinian ideas. Uh, you remember Charles Darwin's uh, master uh, book, uh, Origins of Species, and he wrote shortly after that book uh, another one uh, that uh, was called uh, Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And in that, uh, he uh, made the point that emotions are universal, similar to uh, many other traits, and uh, so he compared then emotional expressions in animals as they compare to humans, as here the, the fearful cat and the fearful person and the angry wolf and the angry woman, and uh, I'm not sure what that is supposed to mean. Maybe the, the funny monkey and the funny man. What is important here to say is that uh, he's, he concluded uh, the young and the old of wildly different races, both with men and animals, express the same state of mind by the same movements. The same state of mind by the same movement. Darwin was brilliant. He was uh, one of the greatest thinkers of all times. However, he made a critical and crucial mistake uh, that was 
um, expressed in this book and that continued in the line of thinking. He sort of saw the human in the animal. Uh, he, uh, it, it, it basically was a, a form of anthropomorphism, a, um, a believing that this dog must feel angry or sad because that's how I would feel in this situation. Or this cat would feel uh, frightened because that's how I would feel in this situation. At what point would we stop? Would a bacterium feel fearful by swimming, swimming away from acid? Is the bacterium feeling fear? Is the coronavirus somehow being angry at us? Um, makes no sense. Uh, at one point, we need to decide where emotions start in humans, where they uh, w uh, and end in, uh, in humans, and where they start in animals and end in animals. And I will present today uh, uh, data and also some way of thinking differently about emotions. And I believe that emotions are the way we experience emotions, uniquely humans, um, uh, uniquely human as, a, as, a, as an experience. Um, simply because they are tied to, to things like consciousness, awareness, and self-related processes that are uh, unique to humans, that uh, you can see in rudimentary forms in some animals, but you will need to think hard if you can translate what a mouse be, how a mouse behaves in a cage versus uh, how, a, how a human would behave in a similar situation. Uh, yet, these kind of ideas were very much uh, carried through in psychology. You might all be familiar with these faces. They were, um, they were part of, an, of a system by, uh, developed by Paul Ekman to initiate, uh, to, to kind of stimulate emotional responses. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, based on facial expressions. And we all can relate to that. We know what, it, what this person feels like. Um, so this was very much tied to a Darwinian biological approach, that there are certain very unique facial expressions that are linked to very distinct emotions that are also, some people thought, that they're very tied to certain activation patterns in the brain and the like. Uh, we, we experience that today when we send around uh, texts with smiley faces, these uh, emotic, uh, emoticons, and uh, you uh, very much, you probably are still remember this movie, uh, Inside Out, by Walt Disney, where this little girl experienced all these different emotions as uh, uh, growing up as a teenager, where certain emotional animals lived in this, in this uh, girl's mind. There was this, uh, uh, this angry part, and the disgusting, uh, disgusting part is here, the, the sad part, and the happy part. Okay, so these emotions being represented as little, little animals living in this girl's brain. This is not how emotions work. And interestingly, uh, Paul Ekman was one of the advisors, scientific advisors, to develop this movie. Um, emotions are often tied to, uh, to colors, just as before you saw when I pointed out this little uh, blue um, person is the, is the sa is sadness and red is, is rage. Uh, so this often linked to emotional expressions and emotional experience. This is a, you might be familiar with this, with this color wheel by emotion color wheel by Plutchik, also very popular, uh, that sort of represents different emotions as different colors. Well, again, I would argue this is quite wrong. Um, emotions are not colors, or if there are colors, uh, you, might, uh, uh, you, know, you might not associate with one particular color. This is not an emotion. I would, I would strongly disagree with that. You go in different cultures, you will have different experiences. And plus, an emotion is not a pure form of any kind. This is not an emotion. This is an emotion. An emotion is complex. It includes contradictory information. It, um, it is confusing. Uh, lots of things are in there, and we don't know what to make out of it. That's an emotion. Um, so in order to make sense of the emotional expression in humans, um, we often uh, distinguish whether the experience of an emotion makes us um, uh, feel good or bad, and whether it's arousing or less arousing, calming. 
So this is often a, uh, depicted in that uh, form. There's a, uh, an emotion being, an emotion being uh, either pleasant, pleasant or unpleasant, or deactivating and activating. And as an exa uh, uh, being excited is an example of being uh, activated pleasant. Uh, being relaxed is an example of being deactivated and also pleasant. Being bored is unpleasant and deactivated, and being stressed or nervous is activated and also and rather unpleasant. Um, again, I would argue this is there's something there's some truth to that. It's it, it is that it makes more sense to organize emotions based on common dimensions that they share. But I would uh, also I will argue toward the end of my talk that this is also very simplistic and incomplete picture because very much we. We, uh, we experience emotions, and just to jump ahead, not only individually as, as, as intra-individual experiences, but rather emotions are experienced uh, through others and with others. And so there's no social aspect of, these, of emotions represented at all. And I would argue this is actually very important. And in fact, ignoring that uh, is not only distorting the picture, but it doesn't tell the story at all. We also know that emotions uh, can be about other emotions. Um, when you feel angry about something, you might feel distressed about feeling angry. You might feel sad about something, and you might feel angry about feeling uh, uh, depressed, for example, or sad. So uh, here's an example of maybe uh, Bob and Mary were, 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 uh, were married for some 30 years, and, and Bob died. And Mary is obviously sad uh, because Bob died, her husband, for 30 years. But this is not the only emotion that uh, Mary ex might experience, just sadness. But maybe also she might experience loneliness. Uh, that's another part of the emo or emotional experience. Um, uh, or she might feel being relieved uh, because he's now no longer there and is not snoring in bed and she has all the space uh, in, her, in her house and maybe she feels, and he was maybe grumpy uh, toward the end of his life and she feels a little relief of the stress that, that was imposed on her. And that in turn makes her feel guilty because she's relieved. So emotions are complicated, compl complex, and multifaceted. Emotions about emotions which, which we would call meta-emotions. Um, so emotion theories in general, there are many of them, but we can organize them, broadly speaking, on a continuum, ranging from uh, the basic emotions, uh, such as uh, these that, that uh, assumes that emotions are discrete, intra-individual um, experiences that are caused by specific brain circuits and brain activation. Uh, this is very much tied to the Darwinian Paul uh, approach that Paul Ekman and others uh, would uh, embrace. And uh, the extreme other form of uh, people such as Elisa Feldman Barrett who claims that, that emotions are being constructed, that emotions don't exist as isolated entities, but rather they depend on the social context in which we experience emotions. Um, the very strong form is that emotions are social language-based constructs that are com uh, context dependent and are not, do not have a unique biological signature. Um, just to depict these ideas in a slightly different way. And uh, so the basic emotions, Ekman, Isert, Keltner, Pankseb, and Tompkins, um, uh, to, as compared to the constructivist ideas uh, by Barrett, Feldman Barrett, and others. Um, and we could go through that, but I won't, but just to, to say a few words, um, uh, you can distinguish those kind of extreme um, uh, forms that in one case, uh, emotions are distinct mental states. In another case, they are, uh, uh, they are not. Uh, in one case, they are um, uh, caused by distinct mechanisms. Uh, in the other case, in constructivist ideas, they're not. Uh, they are, uh, uh, in one case, they are manifested by a distinct physiological behavior. Uh, here, uh, in another case, they're not. And uh, the basic emotion theories assume that they are, it's universal. There's a dis 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 discrete emotions are universal uh, across different cultures. and. Um, uh, they are, uh, we would only, uh, the constructivist ideas assume that they are ba the basic ingredients are universal, but not the emotions themselves. Um, and they are highly variable as compared to uh, the basic emotion theories. Now in between, as you can see, is uh, sort of a causal appraisal theorists uh, that we probably feel most familiar with as cognitive behaviorally oriented individuals. We would assume that both are sort of right in some way, but it's very, it's very much depends on the 
uh, appraisal of a situation, on, the, on what you make out of a situation, that determines how an emotion uh, is experienced. Um, so this is very much in line with Becky and, and, uh, and other cognitive theorists. Now, that gets me to the, to the point of emotion regulation, because it's very much tied to the, the idea of cognitive appraisal. Cognitive appraisal is, is, has been defined by James Gross, who initially uh, began uh, uh, those kind of studies that led to a, a flurry of activities on this, in this particular area, as um, uh, is defined as, the, uh, as a process by which people influence which emotions we have, um, when we have them, and how uh, we experience and express these emotions. To put it uh, differently, a process uh, starts with an attentional uh, phase, uh, so a selection phase of a situation, what if it, uh, then attentional deployment, cognitive change, and response modulation. So uh, it very much sort of it determines on whether you focus, where you focus your attention on, and how, what you do with your emotions. You might suppress them, you might, you might enhance them, you might accept them, and so forth. That is a, a, a very, uh, what was a heuristically very useful uh, way of, of making sense of the complexity of emotional experience. Again, there are my, just to jump ahead already, the critical um, weakness of this, of this idea is that it's a very simplistic input-output model that we walk as kind of mach little machines that process emotions and spit out an emotional response. And I would again argue this is not the way we experience emotions and what we do emotions with emotions. We are social animals, and we very much use others to experience emotions, ex uh, regulate emotions, even manipulate emotions. But more about this in just a second. This is, however, the basic tenet, the basic idea of cognitive therapy. This is very much linked, the pro a process idea is very much linked to this input-output model. And we need to expand that. Uh, a stimulus is being uh, uh, viewed from different viewpoints, cognitive appraisal, it depends on how, what you make of this stimulus. And depending on the cognitive appraisal, you experience uh, certain subjective uh, feelings, have subjective feelings, which is the, the content of the emotion. You have uh, physiological arousal, you have behavioral tendencies. And this may be called the syndrome of a mental disorder that then feeds back to other things. So this is the basic idea of cognitive therapy. Um, and we can elaborate on this basic idea uh, that we also assume maybe there are maladaptive schemas, habitual tendencies to, to deal with certain situations uh, that affect the uh, maladaptive cognitive process, this cognitive appraisal uh, that uh, what we do with the stimulus and attentional resources will be allocated and then uh, this, the, 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 there are feedback loops that maintain um, whatever problem the person experiences. This is a very powerful idea and you could uh, certainly simplify any mental disorder uh, by, uh, by assigning certain um, uh, problem as uh, aspects of the person's experience uh, into this model and make sense. However, I would also say it's a bit simplistic and I will say why, but uh, just uh, to also say a few good you know, aspects about this theory, namely that it has a lot of validity to it. Um, this is a, 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 lot, a review of the literature uh, that examined by Aldao and others that examined um, uh, uh, emotion regulation strategies such as acceptance, avoidance, problem solving, reappraisal, rumination, suppression, and uh, examining to what extent these emotion regulation strategies are tied to psychopathology. And as you would expect, uh, acceptance, the more pers a person accepts one's emotions, uh, the less so, uh, pathology they will show. Uh, but uh, if you avoid, uh, you show a great degree of psychopathology, um, uh, problem solving reappraisal also uh, is, is adaptive, meaning leads to, uh, is negatively correlated with psychopathology, and rumination is maladaptive and suppression also to some extent. 
Now, it's not to say that suppression is always maladaptive. Sometimes suppression is the right thing to do in, certain, in a given situation. Situational context is quite important. So here's an example of a typical way of how people study emotions and emotion regulation. And I should also say that uh, I will show you a picture that is taken from the uh, International Effective uh, Picture uh, Collection, which is very distressing to most people. So I will tell you that in advance, and if you don't want to be distressed, uh, you might just close your eyes. It's an effective way of regulating your emotions by not focusing on the attention on this picture. But uh, this is a typical scenario. You are on a subject sitting in front of a computer screen, and you would see uh, a, um, an instruction such as, the following picture will be distressing, okay? And now um, you, would be, uh, you would, might be uh, assigned to one of three groups. In one group, you would, might be asked to uh, uh, the following. You might be told that the picture was taken by a photographer in order to induce strong emotions in people. Now study the technique that the photographer used to produce this effect. So in other words, you distance yourself from it um, and you see it from another point of view. It's not, it doesn't have to be a real picture. Maybe it is a real picture, but the important thing is you study the, 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 uh, what the photographer is trying to do. It's a very different approach to that picture. Another um, uh, 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 instruction could be, and this is a typical instruction that people use in those experiments. Um, so as you look at the picture, behave in such a way that nobody can uh, see what you're feeling inside, uh, a way to suppress your emotions. And uh, 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 finally, uh, the, instruct, uh, the accept uh, instruction would be, uh, now as you look at the picture, experience the emotion uh, uh, that it creates openly and non-judgmentally. Just let it be, let it, let it come over you. There's a typical acceptance uh, strategy. Now, the next picture will be distressing. So if you want to not be distressed, simply close your eyes, and I can tell you when to open it again. you may open it again. So this was a distressing picture. Depending on how you, uh, what you did with this emotion, you will show very different responses to, for example, an eye blink, res uh, your eye blink response. Eye blink response is you measure the EMG, uh, your muscle uh, uh, reflex, to a loud tone. Um, and the louder, um, a very loud tone, so you, you blink your eyes. And if you're very distressed, you will blink your eyes a little bit stronger than if you're less distressed. We find this effect, to, uh, the, the, this simple instructional manipulation that we've shown uh, has a fairly uh, uh, strong effect on this eye blink startle. So if you suppressed your emotion with this instructional technique, you will not blink your eye as strongly as if you were to uh, accept or reappraise this emotion that you experience as a result of the uh, picture. Um, we could use a slightly different paradigm, and we might be more face valid by asking people to give a public speech in front of a people, in front of a group of people. What I do, uh, just imagine there are a number of people sitting in front of you, and then I could do something different with my anxiety. I could either accept it, I could reappraise it. It's nobody is going to judge me negatively, or even if it's not a big deal, even if they did judge me negatively. Uh, or I could suppress my uh, uh, anxiety. I could say, I don't want to show my anxiety. So the same, in the same way, uh, and we've, we've, we've demonstrated that, in fact, um, this already shown at the anticipation phase, if you reappraise uh, your emotion, uh, that's better uh, than to suppress or to, ac uh, to accept it. Uh, suppression generally is not a good idea, meaning it leads to a, a greater subjective experience of anxiety and it also leads to greater, uh, uh, to elevated heart rate. Uh, slightly so, but significantly so. So meaning that uh, suppression is maladaptive because you don't want to feel strong heartbeat. You're actually trying to suppress it. You don't want to feel anxious, yet you feel more anxious. And you, you also, uh, your, heart beat, uh, your heart is racing faster. Reappraising and accepting is more adaptive because in fact you are more able to regulate your emotions adequately. So we've, uh, uh, acceptance is very much tied to mindfulness and to just leaving it as, as it is, uh, being non-judgmental, open-minded, uh, and experience the emotion as it is. We've shown in meta-analyses that um, 
in, uh, in a later one uh, by uh, Curie uh, and others, which I also uh, was involved, uh, we've shown pretty dramatic effects. Simply, sim these simple mindfulness uh, strategies, uh, meaning sitting there, experiencing emotion uh, openly, non-judgmentally, uh, and training people in this approach has dramatic effects in reducing anxiety and depression. In fact, if you uh, treat people with anxiety disorders, we get a very strong effect size in, uh, in reduction of anxiety symptoms. Uh, and or even if you don't, uh, even if you, uh, uh, this is also true for people who are not even, who don't have an anxiety disorder, but uh, some other problems, anxiety also reduces significantly, effect size of 0.63. So just to put it in context, an, an effect size of 0.8 is large. Uh, so an effect size of 0.5 is moderate. So at, at least moderate, uh, usually even large effect size produced by simple mindfulness-based strategies. You can even get this in, depression, in, in, uh, uh, in reducing depression. Also for the clinical populations, you get a fairly similarly strong reduction in depression uh, among those who are depressed by simply uh, meditative strategies. What is mindfulness? And that becomes now more difficult to define because it's so much, it's so unclear what it actually is. Well, it's a process, it may also be a state, uh, that leads to, ment uh, to, to a mental state that is characterized by uh, non-judgmental awareness uh, of the present moment uh, experience, uh, uh, of the present moment experience, including one's sensations, thoughts, bodily states, consciousness in the environment, while encouraging openness and curiosity. So, difficult to define, but basically what it does is we pay li little emphasis on the content of what you're thinking, more process, more, more uh, on the awareness of what you're experiencing. Um, it is in a way uh, not so much a, uh, not, uh, from being reactive to being reflective. You're simply, you're not responding to something, but rather you, you, uh, you experience it as it is. This kind of form of mindfulness is powerful. We could make it even more powerful by reverting back to other types of meditative strategies that not only focus attention on bodily states, like breathing uh, and sitting and, and experiencing how, how it feels like to sit there, but also by focusing on other people. We have uh, this kind of strategies, uh, meditative strategies called loving kindness meditation. Simple strategies, um, people ex um, uh, are asked to um, imagine an uh, individual who is, who is dear to you, uh, such as a uh, dear friend, and you get a, uh, you might picture uh, the person or a scene, uh, maybe something that you've done with this person, and as you do this and sit there, you, it creates positive feelings. It's, um, it, this is a person who is not a romantic partner, but rather somebody who is really, a, could be a parent, could be a, could be a sibling, could be a friend, could be a pet. And this feeling um, you hold on to for just a little while. And then you transpose this feeling that you get, called meta, toward others. You could start out now with, toward a neutral person that you might encounter every so often in your daily life, maybe at a coffee store or a bus driver. You might then move up to people who, um, who, um, who you had some trouble with, such as a co-worker you had some arguments with, and maybe somebody you don't really like at all, maybe a, uh, some, some people who, who hurt you in the past. Um, it's very difficult to feel loving feelings for it. Often this kind of meditative strategy is accompanied with a mantra such as, may this person live happily, and, and uh, may this person be healthy, and, and the like. We, um, we did uh, a study just like that and examined uh, to what extent this meditative strategy uh, is useful in reducing negative affects, such as depression. And we were actually quite surprised about the results. Um, in, uh, in the, uh, the BDI is a, oops, uh, BDI is a uh, reliable measure of uh, depression. Oops, sorry, I'm going back here. Um, and uh, we've shown from pre to post a drop from 22 BDI scores down to 
four with an effect size of 3.33 and also all the other uh, measures are quite strongly associated with this drop. Very dramatic effects, dramatic. Um, we've shown that also in a, se a second sample of treatment resistant individuals, they underwent uh, uh, pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy and were still very symptomatic and we thought let's give them a try. And in fact, we've, sh we've also demonstrated a very robust uh, decrease in their uh, depression scores as well, as well as an, an increase in positive affect, decrease in other forms of negative affect. This is again, uh, brief, just briefly, a, uh, the instructions that we would use. Uh, so the, the, the mantra would be, may this person be free of uh, enmity, may this person be free of mental suffering, may this person be free of physical suffering, may this person uh, take care of uh, him or herself happily. And again, you, you hold on to this feeling that you get when you, for somebody who you really care for, and then you transpose it to other people. Um, so this led us to a reconsideration of what emotions are really, how emotional distress and emotional regulation is related to psychopathology. We've, we've been too much focused on reducing negative affect in, uh, in, in our field, in psychiatry and clinical psychology. We sort of assume that, well, if somebody doesn't feel distressed, surely they will feel happy again. And positive affect automatically increases as negative affect drops. And that's not the case. You can certainly find people in your clinical practice who will tell you, well, now I, don't, I feel less depressed, but I'm, not, I'm far away from being happy. It's not, I, I don't even remember what it feels like to be happy. Um, so this led us to a general model that an, there's an effective style that everybody has, that uh, some people are much more positive than others, uh, regardless of the, of the trigger what happens. But uh, certain triggers lead to more positive affect than negative affect. But some people are simply, no matter what you throw at them, they are, they're going to make the best out of it. Um, psychopathology, emotional disorder, uh, is very much a result of a dysregulation of this negative affect by ruminating, by tendencies to suppress it, by not trying to accept it. But then also it's a deficiency in positive affect. Positive affect is not targeted through treatment uh, in traditional way. That's why I just presented to you this earlier trial on loving kindness meditation, which seems to uniquely able to lift positive affect. There might be other techniques, but this is a very powerful method to lift positive affect. You might, uh, this model might, might uh, inform also practitioners to think more broadly about uh, what we need to understand in an individual with emotional disorder. So we need to understand, are there any external events that, uh, that, uh, that were part of, of the person's problems? Uh, you could ask simply, what, is, what are the events that are likely to trigger the emotional distress, such as, you know, are there any recurrent patterns? You might ask for about the diathesis. Are there any vulnerability factors? Is the person very shy? Very, uh, any, any personality factors that were associated with that? What's the effective style? What do they typically do with problems? Are they more problem-focused, more, more emotion-focused? Um, what, what, uh, are they more positive versus negative? Uh, you could ask about how do they regulate negative affect? Um, uh, what is the typical tendency to do that? And finally, uh, what is the level of happiness, vitality, quality of life, something we all but ignored in our field? And it has now, obviously, we are all familiar with the positive psychology movement, which, which very much filled this void. But I think this is not the only way how we can approach that. Uh, we need to yet lift a person's uh, positive affect uh, uh, in, in, in many different ways. So far, though, I kind of showed to you what uh, sort of this general model. There, is, there are things outside of the environment, and there's something happening inside the person, right? And uh, you're distressed, and you find a way to regulate it or not. And then depending on whether your regulation strategies are adaptive or maladaptive, you feel either miserable or not, right? This is not how it works. A person doesn't exist as a single, singular individual. We're, we're in this world with a lot of other people. Example of the virus is an example. I mean, it spreads because we're connected. We touch each other. We talk to each other. Uh, we, we are in, in close connection with others. And the past influences our present. 
We have people in the past that are with us. May they be the parents or, or, um, or siblings or previous, previous uh, partners that, that, have, that are part of us, teachers, etc. Uh, we carry with them and yet also even stronger is this connection between the current here and now. Other individuals are with us. And we all are embedded in this large cultural context. And if you move a person from one culture to the next, you'll get cultural distress and, and, uh, and, 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 and there need to be adaptations to a new culture. And obviously the farther away the cultures are, the more this, this is evident. So uh, the way I see it is that we have a, the self is quite, is quite relevant in order to understand emotions. Um, that goes back to the very early slide about Darwin, who all but ignored the self. Um, do dogs and cats have a sense of self? Maybe a little. Do bacteria have a sense of self? I don't think so. They are self-representation self, self, um, uh, uh, self self-representation is quite important. Um, People, the way what we make out of ourselves is an important thing. What triggers an emotional response very much determines what, how we see ourselves. Uh, if, um, if somebody insults us, we get insulted because of that it, it violates our, our, uh, some aspects in, our, uh, in us, in ourselves. Uh, the self is evolving with time on the genetically um, young, uh, Young humans have a different way of describing themselves than older people. And our self is always evolving. The way you feel now is different from the way you felt 10 years ago and will be different from how you feel 10 years from now. Uh, yet there is a core in us, a core self, that stays constant once a self develops. But the social world very much influences uh, this core self. Um, so the core self I would describe as it discriminates, oops, uh, sorry. Um, it discriminates the aspect between uh, what, what, what's me and what's not me. This is what children around two age, years of age or so can do then. Uh, and it, uh, it responds to internal physiological states like pain, hunger, fatigue. And it's limited very much to interpersonal aspects. So in a way, inter the interpersonal emotion regulation is true for the core self but it all ignores but the social aspects of the self. Social aspect requires a presentation of others, the theory of mind. We, are, we need to be able to see things from another person's point of view. Therapy is an interpersonal emotion regulation. Therapy, the therapist regulates with the client uh, or emotional experiences. And uh, it contains social categories, identifies abstract representation of the self, uh, that are specific to groups and cultures, and it gives uh, rise to social emotions. The emotion of embarrassment is a emo social emotion. You can't be embarrassed being alone on an island all by yourself. It's impossible. Uh, and aside from maybe you view yourself as if you were somebody else, then yes, then you can have a put yourself in a person's other person's point of view who's not there. Uh, uh, shame, pride. All of these requires a theory of mind. You need to be able to put yourself in another person's point of view. So just depicted on the, uh, 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 from uh, growing up uh, at birth, uh, the social world is around us, but the core self is, is what, what drives your emotions. And it's only this level of great distress. There's no anger and anxiety and fear. It's just being distressed. You're upset. That's why we talk to kids as you're being upset. But what, what does it mean? The kids can't tell you that they are angry or, you know, they, they might say, I'm, I'm mad at you or something. But, but upset is just very broad. Uh, then uh, during toddlerhood, slowly the social self uh, develops and the core self becomes a bit more distinct uh, and even more so uh, 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 later in life where, where we're trying to integrate it again, what we feel and what, uh, what, what the social self is like. Social self and core self uh, will be linked to different emotional states. So the, the uh, uh, core self is, as I said, sort of a more general distress uh, emotion. Uh, if uh, the trigger leads to a general distress emotion, 
uh, whereas uh, with um, uh, if you remove pleasant stimuli, the, uh, the, uh, the leads more to anger and uh, social self much more to shame. Uh, social self being more tied uh, to social emotions, core self more to non-social emotions, if you will. So as an example of social emotions, cultural expressions are very uh, important in that regard. Uh, so let me just give you an example that we can all relate to. So this left one is a chicken and the right one is a lobster. Now, depending on your culture, you wouldn't be overly distressed by it. Um, most of us are fine with chicken. There's nothing wrong with a chicken. Most of us eat chicken. Lobsters look a little odd, and some cultures are not overly familiar with lobsters, and but, but some of you might still also enjoy lobster. Um, and we have no problem with looking at that, and some of us find it actually quite delicious, right? Now, but, but those pictures uh, may not be overly delicious. Uh, these are people eating insects. These are, uh, these are bugs that are grilled and maggots, and uh, people eat that on a platter. And uh, this is what uh, people in, uh, in Peru eat, these um, uh, guinea pigs, uh, when you see on the side of the road, and people find them quite delicious. Um, for, our, for some of us with a more Western cultural background, we don't find this uh, uh, enticing and, and attractive, and we don't find it delicious at all. Um, uh, for Asians, they might find a lobster kind of odd looking and, and kind of disgusting. Similarly, just as we experience food in a different way and disgust and liking in a different way, we also experience different emotions culturally very uniquely different. Let me just give you an example. There's a phenomenon called kyal attacks. Uh, this is what can be found in some uh, uh, refugee, uh, refugees of uh, Khmer Rouge, uh, Cambodian refugees, who believe that um, have a different view of their body than what Westerners typically experience. Westerners believe, obviously, when, you, when you, uh, there's a heart, and uh, when the heart stops beating, you will die of a heart attack, right? Um, uh, Cambodians also believe that there is a heart, but more importantly, there is a space in the veins that, uh, that is occupied by air. And this air produces inner wind that flows separate from the blood. This inner wind can be blocked in the neck area. And once, and once this pressure builds up, this inner wind can, can burst, and then you would, leave, you would die because... Uh, uh, because your brain would, uh, 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 would be flooded with this inner wind, and as a result, uh, the, the end is, is uh, the person's death. So Cambodians are not so much concerned about dying of a heart attack, they're much more concerned about dying of this um, uh, kyal attack. And um, in order to relieve the pressure, a uh, healer would use a coin and rub against the neck in order to release the pressure. This is an example of the same a panic like phenomenon uh, in some individuals, it's very much focused on the heart. Uh, in another culture, it's very much focused on the neck region because they have a very different understanding of what the, how the body works. Um, another example might be Taishin Kyo Fusho, where people from Korean and the Japanese cultures um, are not so much concerned about embarrassing themselves, but they're more concerned about um, but they are uh, um, uh, doing something or behaving in a way that embarrasses another person uh, and uh, thereby avoiding social situations. There are other examples such as attack at the nervous, where uh, strong emotional um, uh, outbursts in often tied to family distress and uh, shinshu, shenshu uh, anxiety that is attributed to a weak heart that is, uh, is uh, again different from a, from a typical heart for a, a focused panic attack. So we have other cultures that have very different emotional expressions and different emotional experiences. And there are some examples. I'm just gonna point out since I'm, this is my own uh, background, uh, the example of Schadenfreude, which is, um, we have a unique word for that. If, uh, they, if you experience pleasure uh, uh, by looking at somebody else's misfortune, so for example, you see somebody tripping down the stairs and falling, you, and, and it might look funny, as Germans, we laugh, and we find it funny, it's schadenfreude. You kind of find it funny. Um, 
that is uh, not so much the, that the emotion itself is different, but rather we have a word for that to describe it simply because we experience it so much. Um, uh, there are many other uh, examples. Uh, I actually don't see anything uh, unique to, to Polish, uh, to Polish uh, uh, people. So good for you. So we are tied. We are closely connected to others. We regulate emotions through others in a cultural way. Um, and let me just uh, uh, illustrate what this could be. So we, did, we conducted a study. We, we did a, uh, in order to derive, we need to measure it first. How do people regulate emotions with others, through others? So we asked people a number of questions. Um, when, you, when you're feeling upset, what, what do you do uh, when you are around others? How do you use others to regulate your emotions? So the questions were, what are the reasons for looking uh, to other people when you deal with your emotions? When you're upset uh, and want to calm down, what, how do you use others to calm down, et cetera, et cetera. We uh, construct a questionnaire, and these are, the, interestingly, the uh, factors. Uh, one way is to enhance positive affect. We use others to make us feel good, better even. Uh, we use others to, um, to get a different perspective on things. You know, this makes me upset. Tell me how I could see things differently that makes me less upset. Uh, another one is uh, soothing. Uh, simply being, having somebody else who just listens to your problem and says, it's going to be OK. It soothes you. Uh, and finally, social modeling. You actually use others to see how, how did this other person respond in this similar situation that helps you to social uh, to, to, to deal with the similar situation uh, uh, for, you to, uh, for yourself. So this, uh, these are typical ways we regulate emotions through others, with others. Uh, in fact, one could even classify that uh, in, uh, in a way. So um, imagine a, um, 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 a therapist uh, dealing um, with, an, uh, with, an, uh, with a client and how to regulate emotions. Uh, so the, um, uh, depending on, um, uh, on uh, you know, the, so Kathleen uh, might be the patient, and she asked her husband to accompany her to the mall because she's very concerned about going to the mall. Um, that is an example of a response independent intrinsic emotion. Uh, or Kathleen's husband suggests to Kathleen, listen, Kathleen, I'll accompany you to the mall. In this case, uh, uh, the husband uh, is acting on Kathleen. This is an example of an extrinsic response, an independent uh, uh, mechanism. Or maybe Sarah is Kathleen's therapist, and Sarah said, agrees to Kathleen's request to accompany her to the mall in case something bad happens. Or, and finally, Sarah suggests to Kathleen that she accompanies Kathleen to the mall in the case of an emergency. That would have been an example of response-dependent extrinsic motivation. So we. Uh, we constantly regulate emotions, Therape uh, therapeutic uh, a dyadic relationship is an, emotion, is an interpersonal emotion regulation, and you always regulate emotions through others when uh, you really deal with your emotions all by yourself, really. So in addition to this slide that I showed you earlier, one could imagine a slightly different dimension, maybe one that uh, not only lists uh, uh, feeling good and bad, positive and negative, but also whether an emotion shows some low sociality or high sociality such as you know, being happy, being an example of being very positive, um, uh, but uh, low sociality as compared to compassion, which is very much of a, of a social emotion. Another social emotion is obviously being lonely, because you don't have, to, by definition, you're lonely because there's no one else around. It's an example of a negative uh, high sociality emotion. And fear, uh, one could argue, is more of a low sociality and a negative emotion. So I would define an emotion uh, based on what I said uh, as a multidimensional experience. There are a number of dimensions, sociality one of them, uh, valence one of them, uh, uh, arousal uh, another dimension. A multidimensional construct is characterized by different levels of such arousal, degrees of pleasure, displeasure, but it's associated with uh, a subjective experience of somatic sensation motivational tendencies. Uh, and I didn't say much about motivation, but this is also very relevant. Uh, and it's colored by contextual and cultural social factors. And we very much regulate emotions, uh, uh, not only intrapersonally, but also interpersonally, between others, through others. So to conclude, 
emotions are multidimensional, context-dependent interpersonal experiences. They are complex. They are interrelated. Uh, they are shaped and colored by social developmental processes. Uh, and they're regulated through the interpersonal and uh, interpersonal processes. And, um, uh, and, and uh, before I uh, conclude, I'd like to just uh, uh, show, um, show you again this book. So uh, emotion regulation is one of those processes that we've been covering. Uh, uh, we have in there a chapter and some examples of how clinicians deal with emotion regulation. There are many other examples. Uh, there are also um, uh, uh, other processes that we haven't obviously touched on. But um, if you want to know more about this, uh, you may consult this book. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.